Hey guys, this is the baby cubby over here, Michelle, and we have Reva Cook here with us today Hi. from the Healing Group. Um, she Today we're going to be talking a little bit about postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety, as well as postpartum OCD and some other things that Reva's going to share with us. It's going to be fantastic. So, um, is Facebook here, Ryan? Okay, good. So we have Ryan and Kelsey in the background. They're going to be answering all of your questions, or letting us know if you guys have any questions while we're going or um, if you have any stories that you want to share. So please, please, please share your stories and experiences and your questions. Uh, Reva has been so nice to join us and we're so excited to have her here. She is a licensed social worker or an LCSW. And will you tell us a little bit about how you got into it and got with the healing group? Sure, sure. I'm so glad to be here, Michelle. As you can probably tell, I could talk about this for all day. <laughs> um, um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and one of the ways that I got really interested in learning about postpartum issues was I experienced postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression after the birth of my first child, which was 21 years ago. <laughs> that wasn't a thing then. We didn't talk about that. There wasn't a label for it. I just knew that motherhood did not seem like this fun thing that um, you get told it should be. It should be wonderful and glorious. And I was like, I'm not seeing it here. <laughs> so fast forward through my schooling and my my clinical training, and um, one job that I that I have worked um, is as an ER social worker for Intermountain Healthcare, and I noticed we had all of these moms come in who were really struggling with postpartum depression and anxiety, and and they we didn't have any where to send them really. Um, in Utah County, our resources are really limited, which is so sad considering how many wonderful babies we have born. Mm -hmm. So myself and another crisis coworker were like, you know what? See a need, fill a need. And we both had personal passions and interest in this. So we started getting trained. We started doing webinars. We started reading books and then we went to Chicago and got trained by Postpartum Support International, who is like the leader in postpartum education and awareness worldwide. And then after that, I started looking around for, okay, well, where can I serve? Where can I help? How can I start seeing women? And the healing group in Salt Lake has been treating women with postpartum mental health issues for many years. They are the gold standard. Their clinicians are the most trained, the most experienced, and was like, okay, well, if you're gonna do this, let's let's go to the people who really know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to Kristen Hodson, who's the founder and owner of the Healing Group, and was like, hello, there's somebody <laughs> down here in Utah County who cares and wants to do something. Because uh, the Healing Group currently is located in, um, Midvale. Okay. With offices also in Park City. Okay. And <clears throat> met Kristen and kind of got together on this page of like, you know what, what you want is what we want. And so let's, let's do this and got hired by them mm -hmm. to work as a therapist. And my goal is to bring, and their goal as well is to bring the healing group model and excellence and services to Utah County at some point. In fact, our our immediate goal is to get a support group going down here in okay. Utah County by a the first of goal the year. To have. Right, right. <clears throat> um, currently, the healing group offers a support group every Wednesdays at 12:30, 12 12:30 okay. 12 to. 1.30 ish. We always run on mom time, which is ish. <laughs> which right? is perfect because that's what all of us moms <clears throat> need, mom time. <laughs> right. And babes in arms are welcome at the support group. It's so wonderful. I've actually been attending the support group for the last month to get to know the moms. And they're just, it's really inspirational to see people who are reaching out and trying and really trying to work through this really, really hard thing that can happen at a time when you're already overloaded and maxed out. Yeah, that's so, I'm, I'm so excited because you're starting that just because I know that like for me, when I had my first and I just had my second and I was way more prepared the second time, but the mm -hmm. first time I was like, I don't know, I had a really hard time being like, wow, like I enjoy my, I remember my husband and I leaving 
um, my daughter with my parents and I was just like bawling my eyes out that I was yeah. his mom and I had to like take care of this child down. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And like now I know that that was like symptoms, but um, at the time it was just <clears throat> overwhelming. So anyway, um, just for those of you guys that are still joining us, uh, again, this is, I'm Michelle. I work here for the Baby Covey and then this is Reva Cook from the Healing Group. Uh, and she's a licensed clinical social worker and she specializes in postpartum depression and anxiety dis and other mood disorders. So um, why don't you tell us more a little bit about like what you see the most, what moms should be worried about the most, yeah, um, those kinds of things. Sure. So one of the things, one of the facts that we don't often realize with postpartum mood disorders are some of the statistics. Okay. Um, and of course, everyone's experience is different and surveys vary of course but what is generally agreed upon is that between 20 and 25 percent of women will experience some sort of postpartum mood disorder after they give birth and does that include baby blues or is that like specifically no, more that, than baby that blues? doesn't include baby blues which okay. i love that you brought up baby blues well yeah should we talk about baby blues now or in a minute oh we can talk about it in a minute i just wanted to okay. differentiate right so two different things so baby blues and then postpartum mood disorders. <clears throat> Maybe we should just talk about okay, baby blues Okay, right go now. for it. Okay. <laughs> so baby blues is a normal, naturally occurring part that most moms, the majority of moms experience okay. right after birth. And it's characterized by um, mood instability and like you're just kind of all over the place <laughs> and there can be a lot of crying <laughs> and there, and and like one minute you're great and the next minute you're terrible so it's like a and, period times 20 or God. <laughs> and that's a really actually good way to think about it because a lot of baby blues is related to the hormonal shifts that are happening mm -hmm. in your body as your body tries to revert from being pregnant and all of those hormones mm -hmm. and things that your body does then Go to back, back to, to normal. your normal state. So yeah, period times 20 is a good way to think of it. <laughs> <clears throat> and, but we expect that that period will last two weeks okay, or less. If it lasts longer than two weeks, then that's where we start looking at it and going, hmm, what other things are going on here? Okay, Is this a postpartum mood disorder? Uh, so 25%, 20 to 25%. That's a percent huge amount. It's huge. So here's a comparison. About 11% of women develop gestational diabetes. Okay. We screen everybody for that. Okay. Right? Everybody mm -hmm. has to drink everybody the nasty has to drink. Drink the orange drink that right. we all hate. Right. It makes you shaky. <laughs> right? 11%. And it's a really important condition for doctors to get on top of. The mood disorders are also a very important mm -hmm. condition for doctors to get on top of. It can be fatal. Yeah. Postpartum depression and anxiety. Well, we've seen that last year with moms and yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And but the the screening and the testing and the talking about it isn't to that level. Everybody knows about gestational diabetes mm -hmm. and other complications that can come, but we're not to quite that level. So the American Association of um, for OBs and GYNs is recommending now that OBs screen moms at their visits and at their postpartum visit, which is wonderful, but when do you see? Like six weeks? Six, six weeks. weeks. And I had C-sections, so I feel like mine's a little off. I never know. <laughs> That's, you're about right. Okay. And then do you see them ever again? Mm -mm. Not until you're pregnant. Well, and again. then your pediatrician kind of screens you, but it's never more than just a couple questions just to say, are you doing okay? Right. So. And women are often reluctant to speak up because mm -hmm. if you're experiencing a postpartum mood and anxiety disorder, your thinking process is a little skewed. It's almost like there's this filter over your brain and how you process and how you think. Mm -hmm. And women can feel really afraid to talk about how they're feeling. One, because the message you get from society is you're not supposed to be having a hard time. Yeah. This is supposed to be wonderful. I mean, if you just look at Instagram or Facebook or anywhere, it's all these perfect moms who look amazing and they're having such a wonderful time being new moms and it's just not the case. Right. So there can be that kind of stigma of, oh, I'm doing this wrong. I don't want to do this wrong. I'll just mm -hmm. fake it till I make it kind of situation, which is wonderful in some circumstances, but not when you're dealing with brain chemistry and hormones and all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> lots of reasons why women don't want to bring it up. Also, Sometimes there's this fear of people will think I'm crazy and take away my baby. 
Yeah. Which can be a real fear. Like, I know. Absolutely. I, I mean, I know for me, like, this isn't a, like, my mother has a mental disorder mm-hmm. as well. And so she, like, will threaten things like that. And that was a huge fear for me when I was first a mom that, like, she was threatening things like that. And that was horrible. Horrible. To go through. Yeah. So. Yeah. So we've got to do better with the screaming and the talking about it and making it okay for women to admit that they have this problem. So about, depending on the statistics, you look at one in seven, one in five. So if you have five friends, one of you's probably dealt with that. Okay. But when I talk to women, they all tell me they don't know anybody who's dealt with this. And that's so sad. That no one feels like they can talk to anybody so about sad, it. It's so sad, and it's so not true. Mm-hmm. So we've got to get a little braver about opening our mouths and being honest about our experiences, and we've got to get better at listening to women yeah. when they're having a difficult time. Yeah. So you, we, oh, oh, sorry. sorry go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say, do you think, I know for me, I didn't talk a lot about like my experiences with people because I felt like I didn't know like if I didn't know how to say it or I didn't know um, if what I was experiencing was like bad enough to talk about. Does that make right. sense? So yes. like, um, or like bad enough to ask for sympathy or help. So what do you recommend to women who like feel like, at what point do you say that, I mean obviously it'd be great if all of us could get the help that we needed and I think that that's what should happen, but what is the point where, that? what kind of feelings do women experience that you th- say like you absolutely need to make sure you're getting the help that you need and like if you don't get the help you need if you don't start getting the help you need it could get worse like uh, what what kinds of feelings would they be experiencing okay well for one thing is time if we're two more than two weeks out of out of having the postpartum baby, yeah you're more than two weeks postpartum and you're still really struggling that's a time to start looking at oh what should I do and if you kind of look at it in terms of like green, yellow, red, like stoplight. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you're in two weeks, you're still having all of this mood, instability, you're having a hard time coping, you can't sleep, but you're still within that two weeks, then it's kind of green. Let's just watch it. Let's see what's going on. Maybe back up some support with trying to get some more sleep, getting some, some more support from family, mm-hmm. things like that. <clears throat> so the yellow would be you're two weeks out. Okay. Um, you're having a hard time sleeping or you're not getting enough sleep. And one of the things that we know that moms really need is a four hour chunk. Okay. So at least four hours. At least of uninterrupted four hours sleep. of uninterrupted sleep. Babies didn't get the memo. <laughs> I was going to say breastfeeding. Right. <laughs> so two hours. So it can be so, so challenging and it can take a lot of creativity and Sometimes we're not there. Because what do they tell you? How often should you feed the baby? Every two to three hours when they're newborns. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> not awful. It's great that you're feeding your baby, but it is not a fun experience. It's not conducive <laughs> to good brain health, right? Yeah. For moms. So it becomes this kind of like tricky thing where you're like, okay, here's the goal. The mm-hmm. goal is four hours uninterrupted sleep. And here's my reality. Yeah. And how can I kind of get creative? Mm-hmm. to make those work do you together. have do you have any um mm-hmm. like tips on like like what people have done in the past that you know of? I know for me like because I had those experiences with my first when I just had my second I decided I wasn't going to breastfeed at night because mm-hmm. I knew I needed that sleep to not like have be able to manage those feelings mm-hmm. so like that's what I did but obviously that doesn't work for every mom do you have any tips for like right. w- how what they might be able to do or what other people have done yeah sure and and I think your solution illustrates how you have to get creative. Yeah. Right? And we can have these goals and these ideals of how we want to mother and how we want to parent our child. And those are wonderful. And sometimes they have to match up with reality. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think we're doing much better about the idea of feeding and the message is fed is best. Mm-hmm. Boom. Period. The end. Yeah. Just feed that baby, love that baby, Mm -hmm. and that that's the priority. And some moms have done as you have done and said, you know what, I'm not going to nurse at night. Because that husband is just as capable of getting up and making a bottle, guys. It's true. I promise he can do it. Right. (laughs) My husband can. And and that kind of makes some moms feel better about like, okay, I'm still nursing most of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm fulfilling that goal for myself and my baby. And I'm also protecting my mental health. So sometimes that's a goal that works for some moms. Yeah. Some moms 
going straight to bottle is a great solution as well. Mm -hmm. It's good for baby too. <laughs> it's just fine for baby. Sometimes moms will notice that their babies will have longer stretches of sleeping, maybe in the daytime. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it seems like a lot of babies come out and we say they're mixed up. Their days yeah. and their nights are mixed up. So they may have longer stretches of sleep in the daytime where someone else could care for the baby for them. One thing I've noticed with the moms I've worked with that is really tricky is if there's not someone else there who's like designated baby person, mm -hmm. their sleep is like erratic. not very deep and okay. erratic because they're like, oh, I hear the baby, oh, I hear the baby, mm -hmm. you know, what's the baby doing? So <clears throat> getting family and friends to come in and be like, okay, you're on baby duty for f right now. See how long you can let baby go, you know, mm -hmm. soothe baby in other ways before you come get mommy. Um, that can be really, really helpful. And, you know, m sometimes I think that's the most useful thing that friends and family can do is to be the baby watcher. Just offer to do it. While mama sleeps. Yeah. And it can be really hard for moms to let that happen. Mm -hmm. But if it's somebody that you trust and you know that they will come get you if baby needs you, sometimes that can relieve enough stress on a mom's mind that she can get she can some let more go sleep. for a minute and get some sleep. Right. That's and great. babies do sleep more the older they get. So yeah. this is also kind of a this this too shall pass hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because if babies don't always get the memo. <laughs> um and it's a goal. Yeah. Four hours under uninterrupted is the goal. So we want to be working towards that. We want to really focus on sleep mm -hmm. and acknowledge to ourselves the importance of that. Yeah. In healing our brains and healing our bodies and being as being with it. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Nutrition is also an important one. If you're in that kind of yellow category of I, I'm past two weeks and I'm still feeling kind of anxious and, and I'm depressed and I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of starting to wonder. Mm -hmm. So nutrition is a really important one. Um, it's so funny, you know, we become so fixated on babies, they're sleeping, they're eating, keeping them alive, <laughs> that we fail to do those things for ourselves. Yeah. So moms need to make sure that they're feeding themselves, mm -hmm. you know, every three or four hours. And sometimes that can just be small snacks that you grab. Um, when you make sure we include protein, because toddlers can live on a diet of goldfish crackers uh, recovery moms cannot. we cannot <laughs> i wish we could yeah so a little protein in there you know cheese sticks nuts things like that nutrition is really really important okay um so sleep nutrition also some time and space that's baby free okay like even going on a date with your significant other. Or... Yes, or even, you know, your mom comes over and she's on baby watching duty for two hours while you do whatever yeah. you want to do that fuels you up. Because mm -hmm. babies are, they're little suckers of energy <laughs> and everything else. Mm -hmm. And having a break from them is healthy for you and it's healthy for them. Yeah. And I think sometimes women don't realize that they can say that. Mm -hmm. Like, I know... It was always a joke that I said with my husband. I was like, oh, babies are like parasites. They just suck yeah. everything. And it was just a joke. Obviously, like, I love my baby and I don't think that of her. But in some respect, it is true. And it's okay to say that and admit it mm -hmm. and feel that way. Um, and just, but still love, because you can still love your baby and have those feelings that you miss, like, the past of, like, being independent and having, like, oh. be able to do whatever you want. And yeah, <laughs> and you touch on a really good point of... Um, adjusting through motherhood is that there's a there's a grieving process of your past, life, past yeah. life I mean I don't care how long you wanted and yearned and ate to have a baby after that baby comes it doesn't take too much longer and you're like whoa I, I can't I can't do all of these other <laughs> things so grieving your past life is a big part of it yeah and yeah. I think that can be a hard part that lots of people don't admit so or yes. don't talk about Right. Um, but going back to the stoplight. Yes, so okay. we're going back so to the So yellow, red. we're two weeks out. We're our depression. We're still having mood instability. We're feeling a lot of anxiety. We're doing things like that. That's a good time to go and, and um, talk to your medical provider. Mm -hmm. And 
sometimes your medical provider might recommend medication, but more often than not, if you're in that red, kind of yellow category, yeah. um, he or she will be like, well, maybe a support group. Okay. Maybe some counseling. Um, maybe both. Maybe both. And I think that's great to know, because I know for me, like, um, I don't prefer to use medication if I don't have to, just, like, as a general. Not that I'm against people, it, I just I generally don't like to take it. I think people feel that way. Yeah, and so I think, but I think that that's often, um, what the thought process is that's going to happen. Like, oh, if I go to the doctor, they're just going to give me medicine, and I don't want to do that. So I think that's great to know that, like, there's a step before that. There's a step that they'll give you before they say medicine. Yeah. Medication. Yeah. And we have a, a cool acronym that we kind of use to help moms keep in mind some of the things they can do mm -hmm. for self-care if they're in that kind of yellow category. Oh, do you have a question? We do have a question. The question is, if you've had postpartum depression before, are you more likely to have it with subsequent children? Mm. That is a great question. She's talking about risk factors right there. So the short answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> the best answer. <laughs> because, <laughs> because every pregnancy is different and you may have totally different experiences with each of your children. When you talk about risk factors in general, any previous history of depression or mental illness is a risk factor for developing a postpartum mental illness. So if you've had depression, if you struggled with depression and anxiety before you've had babies, that's a risk factor. During your pregnancy, also a risk factor. If you've had it before, it's a risk factor. Um, also, if your family members have, or if you have a history of uh, being really sensitive to hormone shifts, you know, your, your period or things like that. If moving into puberty was difficult for you, that's a risk factor as well. There's a lot of risk factors. Risk factor doesn't mean this is going to happen to you. But understanding what risk factors are kind of makes you do some of these more proactive, protective mm -hmm. things. And history, as she mentioned, is one of them. Okay. So history, and then you said <clears throat> sensitivity to hormone changes. Um, right. If puberty, if going into puberty was difficult for you. Right. And then what were the other ones? Um, some other things. Uh, if you don't have good support. Okay. Financial stress. Okay. Uh, marital stress. If you had complications during your pregnancy or during your birth, or you're trying to breastfeed and you're finding you're having a lot of complications with that. Okay. Other recent major life changes job loss moving uh death of a loved one you know those mm -hmm. kinds of things are going to be more difficult mothers of multiples moms with NICU babies and moms who have struggled with infertility okay so lots and lots of risk factors there right <clears throat> even if you have all of the risk factors that doesn't mean that you're going to have postpartum depression or anxiety, but what it does is it gives you some information about, okay, maybe I need to be aware. Maybe I need to take some steps proactively to protect myself and protect my mood. Yeah. And I think that's like such a good point because when you actually know your risk factors, like I said, like with the first one, with my first, I was so unprepared for it because mm -hmm. I was very mentally healthy before that. Like my bachelor's degrees in psychology, mm -hmm. which I know really means nothing, but I did feel like I was very aware of like my mental health. And, right. Yeah, sure. Um, I felt like prepared to have a baby, but it, when she came, like everything just kind of like crumbled a little bit and I really had struggled and had to find myself again. Mm -hmm. And then, so with my second, I was way more prepared. I like knew that one of the things I were like, one of the things that was a struggle for me last time was like losing that, losing myself from like when mm -hmm. from not being a mom. So I knew I had to like go back to work a little earlier this time to feel like I was back in like, uh, back in like the motions. And then I knew I couldn't breastfeed at night cause I needed that sleep. And mm -hmm. so when you do know your risk factors and know that it might be an issue for you, like it's so good to take those preemptive yes. steps. Cause I know like this time, I've been able to enjoy my second like so much more and love her and not that I didn't love my first two, but like, but just enjoy it more. Yeah. And that's been like such yeah. a cool change this yeah. time. And frequently we'll see women come to us 
who've had postpartum depression before or anxiety before, <clears throat> they'll come to us while they're pregnant and we will we'll work up a, a post-birth plan. That's cool. You know, like, okay, so who is going to be your support system? Who can you count on? And in what ways? What, what is a struggle for you? Like mm -hmm. you became aware of that with yourself and kind of work through that knowledge of self and insight and let's problem solve that on the front end. Yeah. So, and then it makes it much easier if after you have the baby, you start to struggle, then you'd be like, okay, you remember this? <laughs> <laughs> remember how we talked about this might happen? This is what we need to start implementing. And that can be easier than bringing it up for the first time. Yeah. Cause I feel like it's so like going back to what we were talking about before, it's really hard as a new mom with like everyone telling you that it should be this perfect, happy experience <clears throat> to say, I am not having that perfect, happy right. experience. Well, and people blow you off too. Yeah. They're like, oh, you're just tired. Everybody, it's the baby You're just blues. hungry. Yeah. It's the baby blues, you know, and, and going back to talking to your medical provider, I want women to be really clear that you might not get the response that you hope. <laughs> yeah. Because medical providers are people too. Mm -hmm. And some of them are better at this than others and i've i've talked with moms in the er who've been like well my doctor told me to go take a walk oh, well so sad I mean, maybe walks are good walks but... are great nothing wrong with a walk but but her her illness had progressed to a point where we were past walking yeah stage so i was so proud of her for continuing to seek help mm -hmm. you know she didn't get answers that were helpful so she kept pushing for it and when you're already struggling that can be so hard to keep pushing mm -hmm. for the answer so I'm so proud of women who who do that and they do it because they are good moms and they are good people and they want to do what's best for themselves and want to do what's best for their babies um, one of the messages that we give to moms over and over and over again is that you are not alone this is not your fault and with help and with treatment, you can be well. That's fantastic. And that's like the best message that you can give moms. Mm -hmm. Just that one of empowerment, but it still takes work. Yeah. So I think that's good. So, sorry, I want to go back to that stoplight thing that's still. Because I think that's important it. to we'll go back sure to. We don't, don't forget so. about that. Okay, so we have this acronym that we kind of use to help, help moms keep track of some basic self-care things that we know work. Mm -hmm. And the acronym is SNOWBALL. And I wish I could give credit to whoever came up with it, but it's really <laughs> widespread within the postpartum um, mental health treatment field. And I okay. really don't know who came yeah, up with somebody, it. Somebody, somebody really did. awesome. <coughs> if you're watching yeah. this, good job. Yeah, good job. <laughs> so we have S, which is sleep. Okay. And we talked about that. Try, our goal is four hour chunks. Okay. Um, then we have N, which is nutrition. Okay. And we talked about that. And then we have O, which is omega-3s. Okay. So research has shown that omega-3s are very helpful in reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression, both during pregnancy and after pregnancy. Okay. So we will encourage moms, bump those up. Okay. So therapeutic dose, um, what research has shown is between 1,000 to 3,000. Okay. Um, I'm just taking like a multi, we, not a multivitamin, but like the supplements. Yeah, the okay. supplements, right. So add those in. Okay. They're not going to hurt and they're going to help you. Right? So we've got S N O W walking, which pretty much stands for exercise, <laughs> but you know, there's no E in snowballs. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so walking. We'll go with walking. <clears throat> Walking's a better exercise anyway when you're like bleeding everywhere. So. Right. <laughs> We're going for gentle exercise, things that get your body moving. I mean, everyone knows that exercise increases endorphins in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, it lifts mood. So gentle exercise. Okay. Okay. Um, and B. That is uh, baby breaks. Okay. So taking, taking some breaks. breaks from your baby. Most of the moms that I talk to tell me it's really helpful to have those scheduled. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes something that you look forward to and mental health wise having something positive to look forward to lifts your mood every time you think about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, say mom's got baby breaks scheduled on Tuesdays and Thursdays from two to four. Yeah. Her sister comes over or her neighbor will come over. She can even do the baby break in her house 
if she feels like she can't leave baby. Yeah. That's fine. But baby is not her job for those two hours unless there's some sort of crazy. <laughs> crazy they, thing that needs to happen. Because like we said, happen. babies don't read memos. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So. A. A is alone time. Okay. Which can be the same as a baby break, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. Right? We need some alone time. And if moms can use that alone time to remind themselves that they are still human. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you spoke about losing your sense of kind of who I, who am I now? I mean, having a baby like changes your entire identity. Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe reading books that remind you that you are a person mm -hmm. instead of just a walking, talking, baby carrying machine. <laughs> <clears throat> um, alone, baby breaks also can include time with your spouse or your partner. Okay. So baby breaks don't necessarily have to be alone. Alone. Because dads can suffer from postpartum mental illness as well. Yeah, which is like also like as much as we don't talk about like women suffering from it, we definitely don't talk about men. Definitely don't. Sometimes I think it's even worse for the dads because we expect them to like do all of the caretaking of mom. Mm -hmm. And most of the husbands I know try so hard. They bless their hearts. They just want to be <laughs> good husbands and they want to be good dads, but they're struggling with this whole role thing and sleep deprivation and everything too. Yeah. So baby breaks are good for dads too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have alone time. Then we have our L's. One of them is liquids. Okay. Moms need to make sure they're drinking water. There's a reason they send you home from the hospital with that mug. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember thinking, like, when I was in my C-section, like, just dreaming about that uh, that mug filled with water. It was so wonderful. <laughs> when they finally gave it to me, I was like, yes, yes. thank you. Yes. So liquids, and the other one is laughter. Okay. Do some things that make you laugh. Watch some funny shows. <laughs> you know, something that lifts your mood, lifts your endorphins. Read some so, good mom memes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. They're hilarious. They're so good. And there's some great, like, funny Instagram parenting accounts accounts yeah, yes but so i'm like good. what are those You're good. called what? accounts <laughs> thingies <Beads. clears throat> yeah so snowball yeah kind of some self-care if you're falling in that yellow area add that check that out where am i missing what can i add and see, see if, if things keep continuing on then um then you're starting to move kind of orangish reddish okay right i don't want to say all the way red because that red means a true emergency, and we'll talk about what that, okay. that means. <clears throat> okay? So if you're doing the self-care things, and you know, you're doing the best you can, but you're still mm -hmm. really, really having a hard time, then it's time to start looking into counseling. Okay. or going back and talking to your doctor and saying, maybe I do need a mood-stabilizing medication. Okay. And there are lots of medications that can be safely taken mm -hmm. while moms are nursing. And while they're pregnant, so if you know your mood instability starts before that, there are there are medications. If your doctor tells you that there are not, get a more educated doctor, <laughs> <laughs> one that's a little more up to date, because because there are okay there are options, lots of options yeah. out there. And when we treat regular depression and anxiety, the gold standard is meds plus therapy. Okay. If it's disrupting your life so that you're not functioning, meds plus therapy is gold standard. Same thing for postpartum, but every mom has to make those choices for herself mm -hmm. and what is gonna fit with her values and her goals. But if she's not functioning, you gotta keep getting that help. Yeah. Okay, so the red area. This is where you need to get help immediately yeah no more waiting no more like talking it out no Have more waiting no more talking it out any thoughts of suicide thoughts that you want to harm yourself that your baby would be better off without you that you cannot do this anymore and you start thinking of ways to end your life okay that is a medical emergency you need to go to the nearest ER and you need to have a crisis evaluation and they will help you determine the next best the next step, step to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. um, that might mean hospitalization. It might not mean hospitalization. But that is the fastest, quickest way you can get a professional's eyes and ears on the situation. Yeah. And having 
um, working for Intermountain and being one of their crisis workers as well as working for the healing group, I can vouch for all of them in Utah County. They're very well trained. They're also very well trained in postpartum mental health because I did that training <laughs> You're like, I know <laughs> they are. <laughs> so if any of them don't do what they've been taught, then... Just talk to Reva. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell them that Reva told you to come in. <laughs> and if they don't know what they're doing, tell them to go pull the PowerPoint up. On <laughs> so that may mean hospitalization. It may, it may not. A lot mm -hmm. of times we can create a good safety plan. Um, feeling like you are going to harm your baby. Mm -hmm. that's an emergency you need to go get help for that right and I guess away. a question with that one like I know like for me since I had a lot more like anxious feelings rather than depressive feelings mm -hmm. I did have like anxieties about like um <clears throat> like tripping down the stairs and like hurting my baby so I'd have to be like super careful when I would walk downstairs mm -hmm. or um like for me like driving in the car was a fear so like I was like crazy and I still am crazy about like <laughs> car seat safety and like not a bad thing. The, yeah not a bad <laughs> thing to be crazy about but like um so at what point like do you say like obviously like, those are nor those can be normal fears mm -hmm. so like at what point do they become like not normal anymore right and I guess what's the difference great question and what you're talking about is what we call intrusive thoughts okay and they're part of postpartum anxiety disorder kind of a subset comes okay. under obsessive compulsive postpartum disorder and the more of the obsessive part versus compulsive but these are thoughts that just like pop into mom's heads you know they'll see something that could be dangerous to a baby mm -hmm. and they can like imagine their baby being harmed that way um i've seen a lot of moms have described those to me as it seems like a movie playing out yeah in front of their eyes they can like see it yeah mm -hmm. they can see it so they'll be like you know giving baby a bath the intrusive thoughts will like pop into their head and sometimes moms will get really worried they're like oh, does this mean i'm gonna do this to my baby mm -hmm. i'm a terrible person I'm having these thoughts. You can't control intrusive thoughts. All of us have intrusive thoughts all day long. Yeah. Sometimes they're good ones like, oh, they're sweet, I should go. You know? <laughs> um, I need a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> right? And sometimes they're, they're weirder. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're, they're, they don't make any sense. In our normal lives, we just kind of dismiss those. We don't allow intrusive thoughts to stay in our heads. They just like, maybe notice them as they go by. Oh, yeah. That's weird. <laughs> that was a weird <clears throat> thought process. Yeah. But if those intrusive thoughts are attached to your baby and your baby being hurt, those are going to be distressing. Mm -hmm. And if those thoughts are distressing to you, actually that's a really, really good sign. Mm -hmm. That means that you are aware that those are wrong that those should not happen. The uh, psychology word for it is ego dystonic. Mm -hmm. And that actually means you are not gonna act on those things. Okay. There has never been a case of a mom with intrusive thoughts hurting her child. That's amazing. That's like ever. Cause that's I feel like why people get worried about those intrusive thoughts. And so, but that means you're a good mom and that you care. So right. Yeah, and they're doing a lot of studies about where those intrusive thoughts develop in one particularly fascinating study that I hope can be replicated and we learn more about is that those thoughts are related to an increase in oxytocin. And oxytocin is that bonding chemical that makes moms feel protective of their babies. Mm -hmm. So really those thoughts are like overprotecting of your baby. Okay. You're, and moms will do the craziest things to deal with those thoughts. Like I, like I have met moms who would before their husband left for work, they would get everything all set up around the rocking chair. They would get snacks, they would get diapers, they would get everything that they needed for the day set up around the rocking chair and they would not move from the rocking chair all day. Oh, that's so Because sad. they had intrusive thoughts of something happening to their baby while they were holding their baby or walking or standing with their mm -hmm. baby. So she was working overtime. Yeah, that is that poor mom. Oh, that right? makes my heart for her. Uh, she's there's more than one mom that I talk to like that yeah or moms that have intrusive thoughts about um, knives and they'll remove all of the knives from the house so you're not crazy if you have those yeah you just may feel like you are but if you have those that is a time you really want to go get some therapy really check out some meds because they're causing you some significant distress in your life mm -hmm. and we can actually do a lot in therapy to help moms learn how to process those and deal with them and not have them be so distressing yeah so those can be helpful so i would say those are probably more an orange-ish 
pink area. Paint, paint orange area. Right. And then the red area is when you're like not when they're not distressing you anymore. Correct? Right. Red would be like you want to harm yourself or your baby and that makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense to you. That to seems like that. the logical thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that's an emergency as well. If you are not functioning at all, you can't care for your baby, you can't care for yourself, that's an emergency. Mm -hmm. Get some help. So something too that I remember this time in the, with my lot, the one that I just had, um, they told me how like the best person to tell whether or not you're having issues is going to be your significant other. So for me, like that's my husband. And they're like, if your husband says that you are having problems, you need to listen to him so that you can go get the help you need. Um, I mean, is that has that played out with like what you've seen across? I think that's or? true for a lot of women or other family members. Okay. Typically, when I have seen women who've come in for help, a common thread is my husband told me I needed to be here, or my mom told me I needed to come, okay. or my sister. Somebody that they trust who's more objective, able to see more objectively mm -hmm. what's going on. Yeah, and I think that it's important to know that just so that, I think sometimes you can get defensive. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like if my husband had come to me and been like, you need help, obviously you wouldn't have said it that way. You'd be like, but you I'd need be help. like, you need, the, you're the one that needs help. Like, I don't need any help. I'm great. <laughs> so, but I think it's good to know that like other people care about you and they might come and tell you like, hey, you need help. And it's okay to listen to right. that and know that you're not crazy and that you're not like a bad person or a bad mom. It's just going to make you a better mom. So, right. yeah. Yeah. We can always get checked out mm -hmm. and either be reassured or sent down a better path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I definitely agree with that. Sorry, I'm just going to do a time check with Kelsey and Ryan. Are we doing good? Or? Um, I don't know what time. It's 10, 12. Okay. Well, we'll just do some questions then. So if you guys have any questions, um, we'll have Kelsey and Ryan let us know if there are any questions out there. Uh, so go ahead and type those away. Yeah. Oh, one little thing that yeah. can help moms determine where they're at oh. is um, is to do a kind of a self-screening. Okay. So the Edinburgh Depress Depression Scale, mm -hmm. um, you can find it online easily. And it's the I Edinburgh Depression Scale? Edinburgh, Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. Okay. It's 10 questions, really fast, but it has been proven clinically to be very, very valid in determining if a person is depressed, okay. if a mom is depressed. It's not so hot on anxiety, but it can give you a good sense of, okay, yes, I'm good, or no, something's wrong. And it will even give you a rating. If your score's in this this range or this range, you need to do something about that. Okay, that's great to know. So we can add, and I'm sure we can go ahead and add a link to that on our Facebook and YouTube channels where this will be um, as well. So Insta our Instagram followers, if you want a link to that Edinburgh scale, we'll add a link to our Facebook uh, post with this video on it and to the YouTube when we put it up tomorrow or not on Monday. So if you want that, it'll be there. Um, did we have any questions come up, guys? Okay, well, we'll just finish up then. Thanks so much for coming, yeah. Reva. And again, she's with the Healing Group. So, and they are up, you say Murray? Sorry. Mid uh, Midvale, sorry. So they're up in Midvale. Yeah. Just off the freeway. So I always tell people it takes as long to get there from here as it does to get down to Provo. Perfect. So sometimes because it's in Salt Lake, people are like, ah, it's too far away. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, the distance is, it's the same. Perfect. You're gonna go south or north. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So if you guys do need help, they are a fantastic resource. Again, like she said, they are the gold standard here in Utah for postpartum mood disorders. Um, and really quick, I just wanted to touch on before we end, like, obviously we talk a lot about postpartum depression. We were talking about that before, but like, what are the other mood disorders that maybe women should be looking out for that maybe they don't have, that aren't talked about as right. much? Yeah. Um, if maybe we want to touch on that really fast and then we'll end. Sure. Yeah. So, so postpartum depression is the one that's most common and sometimes people like shorten the whole thing oh she's got the postpartum <laughs> that's not a thing <laughs> that's not really a thing uh postpartum depression is really interesting in that it tends to be a, what we call an agitated depression okay so sometimes you will see people who can't get out of bed they can't function they seem really sad they seem really hopeless sometimes it could also be a come out in irritability 
Okay. Or anger. That's one of the most common symptoms okay. of postpartum depression that I hear from moms. They're like, I just want to rip everybody's head off. <laughs> um, and that can be part of depression because it depends, starts to be more agitated. Anxiety, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. And um, anxiety can just be lots of worry, lots of excessive concerns. You can't settle, you can't sleep, you can't relax. Um, and then we also talked about intrusive thoughts, which can be part of postpartum OCD. Okay. Postpartum PTSD is also a really big thing. Um, and if you have experienced a difficult birth or a difficult pregnancy, um, you can develop PTSD from that. Mm -hmm. So that can be a really common thing too. And sometimes we don't talk about our birth experiences mm -hmm. and how they affect our our mental, our mental health and our continued experience with parenting. So that can be a thing as well. Yeah. Um, and postpartum psychosis, which is what we've talked about if you are feeling like harming your baby makes sense. Okay. And that is an absolute medical emergency. Mm -hmm. Those scary stories that we hear in the news, those are women who are suffering from that. It is a very, very rare illness, 0.1 to 0.2% of postpartum women. So very, very rare, but of course, very scary and dangerous yeah. when it happens. And it's a tricky one because the detachment with reality can ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. So you can family be attached members, and then be right? So family and members can be like, "Oh, she's making total sense," and then there'll be weird thoughts, and then mm -hmm. have worries before. Did you have anxieties before? Was depression a part of your life before? If it was, then having a baby is may really flare that up, mm -hmm. and then you may find you go back to your baseline level. For a lot of people, mental illness become something you manage throughout your lifespan as it comes and goes. Okay. But for many other women, postpartum depression is temporary okay. and it's treatable and you get through it and never experience never it have it again. Okay. So your personal experience is just going to remain to be seen for any individual woman. It's just going to be remain to be seen. So our goal is we are going to proceed like this is going to get better. We know what we can do to reduce your distress. We know how to help you. And that's going to be our goal. Mm -hmm. And it would be wonderful if you didn't ever have to experience that again. If you do, we've given you some great tools to know how to manage, to know how to manage things and to deal with it. Okay. And one website, that two websites I really want to plug. One is the healing groups, thehealinggroup.com. And we have a link to resources and things like that. Mm -hmm. And another one is um, the Postpartum Support International website, postpartum.net. And you can link to their warm line where you can call to get help, okay. to their local coordinators to find help anywhere in the world to find wow. specialized providers. That's awesome. And um, they also got a lot of other resources on there too. Okay. And then Ryan, did you? The question is, are the medications different, postpartum depression versus anxiety? And then how are they different? That I feel like they have been lumped together, which was a struggle for me. It's hmm. a good question. So the tricky thing about that is a lot of mood stabilizing medications do affect both depression and anxiety. And that is true whether you're dealing with those issues postpartum or whether you're dealing with those issues just as a regular non-postpartum person. So people who have anxiety are frequently prescribed a medication that's called an antidepressant, but it has mood stabilizing effects. There are medications that are specifically just for anxiety. They're sedatives. Typically those medications need to be used very sparingly and absolutely under a doctor's direction and um, used occasionally on short term. So it's more for if you have like an anxious episode. You right, would go you're that. having a panic attack mm -hmm. and you can't get out of it. Your doctor may prescribe you one of those medications to use as needed. So is that why antidepressants are more often prescribed for postpartum anxiety? Because it might be like, a, like you'd be feeling that every day almost and because they want to be used sparingly, they just want a mood stabilizer instead. Is that a reason? Or? That's part of it. The medications that are sedatives, um, 
they're just a medication that needs to be more monitored okay. and that generally they're not intended for long-term use. Okay. So if a mom is experiencing a mood instability, they want to try and get ahead of that and stabilize the moods overall. Rather than just the one episode. Rather than, than just kind of band-aid this episode and that episode. It okay. all depends on the woman. Okay. And having medical providers that she can depend on and can count on to work through that with her. Mood stabilizing medications take um, some time to work, mm -hmm. you know, uh, four to six weeks usually. So sometimes short acting things for anxiety will be used in the interim, but your goal is overall mood stabilization, both depression and anxiety symptoms. Okay. That's awesome to know because I think that can be Is really that helpful? Confusing. I hope that helps. Okay, is there any other questions? Okay, we'll finish up then. We will provide all the links to both the healing group and that uh, postpartum.net, you said postpartumsupport.net. Mm -hmm. yep. um, we'll provide all those on our Facebook page as well as the YouTube when this goes up on Monday on our YouTube channel. So if you guys have any other questions, definitely direct them to the healing group. They are fantastic and we are so excited that they were able to come today um, to educate us and help with everyone. So yeah, we will see you guys all later and have a great day. Hey.